Hello everybody and welcome to Plural Group History in the Age of the Internet with us, your hostess with the mostess, LB Lee. We are a car multi-cartoonist in the Boston area and Vulture Magazine even had the decency to call us the best cartoonist you've never heard of because I guarantee you, you've never heard of us. Anyway, so we have seen a lot of plural communities rise and fall, even over just our like roughly 13 years in the community. And because of the ephemerality of online communities, a lot of these groups and everything they've taught each other just is disappeared into the wind. Like, even the Wayback Machine, you have to know what to look for even to look it up. And so much of our history is so ephemeral that we end up reinventing the wheel over and over each time. What my history teacher in high school told me is true. Those who don't remember history are doomed to repeat it. So hopefully in this video we can share the basics. Um, because of how compartmentalized these communities can be, like one thing that you'll probably notice as we go through is that there will, are a lot of different groups kind of operating completely independently of each other with their own philosophies, their own bugaboos, their own vocabularies, often completely unaware that this is not the norm. And I'm going to be covering like, I'm going to be using the term plural here in like the most biggest like umbrella term possible. Like any sort of like more than one person in a body is fair game, but there's still a whole bunch of these communities that basically I'm going to be able to say, they existed! Moving on! Uh, for instance like, Metaphysical multiplicity, tulpas, other kin, religious and cultural frameworks of plurality, like, all this is stuff that I don't know about. So there's a whole bunch, there's so much history waiting to be brought up by people who know it, and I really encourage folks to bring their own histories to the table so that we can learn from them and not repeat them. And while I originally created this talk with the idea of it being in the age of the internet, 1989 to the present, um, I realized we can't really talk about how we got there without talking about how we got there, where we came from. So we're just going to try and cover the basics real fucking fast. So my personal hypothesis and what little reading I've managed to do gives me the suspicion that like what we call plurality it's sort of a creation meant in backlash to this cultural norm that we don't really acknowledge. Namely, that there is one person to one body, or personality, soul, spirit, whatever you want to call it, stapled together for all eternity, and anything different from that must be pathological and needs a whole new section of vocabulary to cover it. But I don't actually think that norm is universal. At all. Like, that seems to be a specifically, like, white medical idea. I don't even know where this idea came from. I don't know if it's from Christianity, I don't know if it's from the Enlightenment, like, but this idea seems to have gotten ingrained, so plural and the multi-words got made in backlash to that. But I think, before all that, there were probably different cultural frameworks of describing experiences that I, for the purposes of this talk, might call plural. Like, be that demonic possession, or like, my dead grandmother talks to me, or I'm in communication with the spirits of this land, or anything like that. Like, there were probably a whole ton of cultural ideas and ways of discussing personhood and what it meant to be a person and the relationships between them that's just kind of lost. So, for the sake of this talk, just kind of for the sake of argument, I'm going to start with Mary Reynolds, who I don't actually know if that photo is of her, but it's the only thing even close I've been able to find, so we'll see. Um, Mary Reynolds is sometimes called the first multiple, even though, like, how do you even declare that? But she sort of gets the credit sometimes, and she, I think it started in 1811. Her family immigrated to the U.S. and lived in Backwoods, Pennsylvania, and they immigrated from England, I think? Um, and basically, Mary, who was apparently a very religiously devout, sort of passive, kind of depressive woman, one night she went to, she slept in unusually deep sleep and came to as a very different bubbly personality. And they would switch back and forth for over 15 years until they finally settled. Uh, you also have Anselborn, who you can tell that is a guy with a lot on his mind. 
Um, and he kind of is probably the most famous of these old cases that are now sort of recategorized as the dissociative fugue cases, which is generally, they sort of had a specific type. They are going about their lives fairly ordinarily, and then they just disappear, only to be found somewhere else, generally conducting a very ordinary life as a different person, until suddenly they snap out of it and go, where am I? What's going on? Um, and so there were a few folks like him. There were, uh, Anselborn was in 1887. You have George Robertson in 1901. John Charles Pulteney, a.k.a. Charles J. Poulting in 1933. And they all sort of had that same, like, they tend to be more serially sl singlet. They would switch between one or the other. And then, but there wasn't very much difference between, like, their personalities. It was just sort of the name and what sort of events or memory they were having. You also have the, uh, what I'm calling is a group like the age regressors, who were these people who, like, generally due to a head injury, or in one case the, a gas leak leading to presumably brain damage, um, they are suddenly d stripped of all memory and kind of reduced to infancy and have to be retaught to live over and over. So, and you also have a group that is more interesting for the purposes of this talk, the spiritualists, who they were around like, the spiritualism started in the 1860s, but the spiritualists I've heard of range from like 1899 to like 1920 or so. They include the most famous uh, Helen, under the pseudonym Helen Smith, who had the book From India to the Planet Mars written about her. Um, Patience Worth, who was the pseudonym of Pearl Curran, and a spirit that she was channeling. And the spiritualists are of interest because while the age regressors and the few cases and Mary Reynolds, like, they were, there wasn't really a sense of, for lack of a better word, interiority. There was just, sometime Anselborn walked off and started running a general store but under the name Arnold Brown. But there wasn't this sense of, like, a deep interiority, the headmates weren't aware of each other, like, there was this complete amnesia. While the spiritualists, they very much framed it as, we are channeling spirits, we are channeling the dead, or past lives or reincarnations. And so they often came with, like, their own personal histories, like, ah, I am Leopold, I come from blah blah blah, I, like, you could have, uh spirits of different genders or cultural backgrounds or different ethnicity or different class backgrounds than the medium. And in the case of Helen Smith, the reason her, the book is called From India to the Planet Mars was she claimed to channel, like, these spirits or past life reincarnations of, like, being on Mars. That was, like, oh. the incarnation of, like, a deceased child nephew of one of her fellow spiritualists who she claimed went to Mars and she painted these landscapes like this is one of Helen Smith's paintings of Mars and you know she would like write in Martian and such and so you have this much deeper richer like sense of place in person than other early cases and obviously now we scientifically know that this is not what Mars looks like there are not people like this on Mars and so, we're sort of, and of course, like, a lot of people just use this to go, oh, like, they were just making it up, they were just faking it, but I feel that this is, like, a precedent for this interior world, even if it's more, or, you know, even though it's perceived as out there, us visiting Mars and such like that. You also have, like, a couple of the old fo- there's one case called Alma Z, where there were three headmates who all answered to Alma, um who got along pretty good, and everyone seemed to, like, support them and be like, oh yeah, we like Tui, we like number one, we like the boy, all three of them are good eggs in our book, and so there was this sort of family support, and sort of, like, a group cohesion that is kind of uncommon from this time. And trauma is mostly not reported in these early cases until around 1905-ish, so roughly a hundred years ago. And Although, like, sometimes there were implications that, like, something was amiss, but it's a long time ago, the records can be pretty sparse on the ground. And theories as to why people became multiple was everything from their channeling spirits, they're having actual visions of another world, metaphysics, head injury, epilepsy, 
Almazi was credited to school stress, which could mean anything, um, but who really knows? And also, this uh, medical multiplicity of sort of like the age regressors and like Mary Worth and Fugue, Ansel Bourne, stuff like that, uh, they tend to be. It was overwhelmingly applied to white folks, but it was fairly gender balanced, like you had fairly equal amounts of men and women until again around 1905. And so it's like medical multiplicity became a woman thing around the time it became a trauma thing. Um, even though the fact of the matter is, like, contrary to what I learned when I was younger, like, women were organizing and fighting sexual abuse and rape long, like, before this time, or around this time. It was just overwhelmingly black women and wrapped into anti-slavery and anti-lynching activism. So, for me, one of the questions that comes up is, if trauma is a requirement of multiplicity, there's research just begging to be done about historical black frameworks for how this plurality, if it manifested, how it manifested, how it was dealt with. So, just saying. Also in 1886, uh, Jekyll and Hyde came out, which even though it wasn't really about multiplicity from what I heard, the pop culture zeitgeist let go, took it and never let it go. And you will see that like pop culture has a huge thing in how multiplicity goes. So, you know what we really have to thank for the popular conception of multiplicity today? Television. Television and movies. Like, books were big too, but movies seemed to, like, really kick it up a notch in a way that it hadn't before. So, in 1954, Shirley Jackson wrote a psychological novel about a multiple called uh, The Bird's Nest. And the book itself was fairly popular, but what we care about is the movie version in 1957. And the movie uh, changed things around a bit. This uh, Lizzie was now, instead of five people, was just three people. And the three women, the three members of Lizzie, kind of embodied these archetypes that I guess I would call, like, the good girl, the bad girl, and the fixed girl. There's the good girl who's kind of passive and depressive but does everything she's supposed to, and there's the bad girl who expresses all the sexual and aggressive impulses denied her, and then they merge together to become the fixed girl. If this sounds familiar to you, it should, because that's the three faces of Eve. However, as far as I can tell, Lizzie came out first by like six months, and the three faces of Eve was a rush job, both movie and book, to capitalize on the popularity of Lizzie. And Chris Costner Sizemore, the real-life Eve, signed the rights for it to her therapist who sold it to the movie. She got paid about $7,000, which was quite a lot of money at the time, but certainly nothing compared to what it became. And oh, we'll come back to Chris Costner Sizemore. Like, but The Three Faces of Eve, even though it's one of the most famous, like, multi-cases of all time, it's not accurate. Chris Costner Sizemore later wrote her own three books, one in 1958 called, I think, Strangers in My Mind, which seems to have vanished off the face of the earth. I haven't been able to get my hands on it anywhere. Um, in 1977, I'm Eve, and then in 1989, A Mind of My Own. And she managed to get the books out, and where she was basically like, yeah, The Three Faces of Eve was factually incorrect. This was not how it went. It was dra dramatized for this movie. It, I wasn't even three people, I was rotating sets of three that happened over the course of decades. So she was more like over 20 folks, not just three. And then Sissy Spacek had an interest in the A Mind of My Own movie in the late 80s, and then Fox said, no, we own the rights to your life story. Forever. Past, present, and future. You don't get to ever, like, do it. And she had to take them to court. and. I'm not entirely clear what happened, like, her book still existed, but the movie never happened, and there's a reason everyone remembers The Three Faces of Eve, and nobody remembers A Mind of My Own. So, yeah, like, we'll come back to that. So, in 1973, Sybil came out, and it too got a book, in a movie, in 1976. In 1977, there was The Five of Me, which also got made for a TV movie in 1981. You might notice a pattern in here. 
Um, Henry Hawksworth is also of minor interest because uh, he was a abusive drinker, violent drunk driver who uh, used multiplicity in his defense for against drunk driving and his whole defense was I'm not multiple anymore therefore my drunk driving headmate doesn't exist you can't prosecute him so I'm not guilty he did get acquitted though it possibly for a different reason and it's again probably not a coincidence that the five of me was in 1977 right after Sybil came out it was probably trying to write on the coattails of Sybil and then in 1981, you have The Minds of Billy Milligan, which covered the events in 1977. Billy Milligan was caught after robbing and raping three women in October 1977. And then used uh, not guilty for reason of insanity, claiming to be multiple, got judged not guilty for reason of insanity, and at least this one doesn't get a movie. Not yet, anyway. Apparently there's been one in production hell for over a decade. Joel Schumacher was set to direct it, which is just... That sure is a thing. And meanwhile, back at the DSM ranch, the DSM-3 gets made in 1980, and the diagnosis of multiple personality disorder becomes a thing right around this time. But... It, and in the DSM-3, it specifically notes that, like, cross-gender and cross-ethnic alters are a thing, which these folks have, like, Roggen of Billy Milligan was a Slav, for instance, Arthur was an Englishman, and there was a long precedent for it before. Um, cross-gender alters, indeed, it was Billy Milligan's lesbian headmate, Adelena, who they claimed to have raped those women. Ragan apparently robbed them, but was horrified at the idea that anyone would think he'd rape anybody. Um, and also, the DSM-3 stated outright that MPD was overwhelmingly a woman thing. A white woman thing. Though they don't say that part outright, but a bunch of books from this time note that it's mostly a white person thing, or so they say. Like, there are a few s significant examples, of exceptions to this rule, like Henry Daniel Hawksworth and Billy Milligan, but, like, by this point, it has now become a woman thing. And part of that is, you know, in the 70s, with around the time of Sybil, you start having the second wave feminist movement, there starts being, um, not the first, but a lot of people remember it as when incest and sexual abuse were becoming a household discussion topic and coming into the pop media, which, again, this wasn't true. The anti-lynching, anti-rape campaigns, black women were fighting back a century prior, but that's how people tend to remember it. And as you can see, like, the multi-narrative is starting to become its own thing. Like, multi-books have now become, like, their own genre with very strict tropes. There's the really, like, suffering multiple, often like a gruesome history reported, a thera the saintly therapist who may or may not have written or helped to like make money off of the book. Like, it's a very... it's starting to get weird. And also, in the midst of all this, like, it's getting weird enough, but then we have Michelle Remembers in 1980. Yeah, I don't expect any of y'all to really have heard of it. I hadn't heard of it until doing research for this. They have these very strict tropes. Like, it's almost like how, you know, it's like a very specific subgenre, like the 1970s trucker movie or the 1990s rom-com, where you have these very strict, like, genre rules of, like, exactly what gets reported when. The only problem is this is treated as nonfiction reality, and people are looking to this for, uh... They're looking to see themselves reified, to see themselves reflected, made real. When the fact is, these are things made to make money and with really creepy power dynamics in it. And yet at the same time, more and more people, because of schlock like this, um, are starting to see themselves. They're like, wait a minute, that reminds me of something I've been thinking about. And so, as more and more stories come out, and more and more people, like, start discussing it, it... more multiples start crawling out of the woodwork, more people are being diagnosed, and everyone's starting to, like, kind of wonder. 
Like, people were going, where are all these multiples coming from? Did we create a monster? Personally, I don't think we did. I think that, like, for lack of a better term, like, this greater umbrella term of plurality may have gotten shoved underground for a while, but is coming up. And this is just, through this framework, like, this is how people are able to discuss it at all. Um... And poor Chris Costner Sizemore, like, and the people actually trying to tell their own stories without that, those genre constrictions, kind of get forgotten. Like Chris Costner Sizemore's books. It doesn't help that Hollywood did not want Chris Costner Sizemore to be able to make a movie about her life. They claim to own her life story, and I feel that's a thing about multiples. Our life stories don't even get to be our own. They get to be owned to make money. And that's concerning. Chris Costner Sizemore herself, or Sybil Dorsett, whatever her real name was, Billy Milligan, they themselves are not the problem. It's how, like, our life stories get co-opted and used to peddle this narrative and make a lot of money. Often not our money. There is one of the old multi-books that I do want to mention, and that's When Rabbit Howls from 1986. Um, in some ways it fulfills the narrative that I've already discussed, but there are a few differences. Namely, they don't go, go by their legal name, Trudy Chase. They go by the troops for Trudy Chase. They wrote another book that got published posthumously, and that is their author card. Like, people say Trudy Chase, but they have never called themselves that uh, in their own author. They always used their group name. They also discussed um, internal landscape and internal internal dynamics of people interacting with each other, helping each other, talking to each other, um, with a level of depth and sophistication that hasn't really been seen as much. Like, The Minds of Billy Milligan covers it a little, but when Rabbit Howls dials that way up. Um, the troops are also responsible, as far as I can tell, for coining the words like the front runner, which got sort of back reverse engineer to like referring to the front as to when someone is interacting in corporeal reality. Um, and they also seem to have started the idea, or at least helped popularize the idea, that you do not need to return to being singlet to be okay. Like, in their book they have the slogan, two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate. Um, and, of course, it gets its damn movie adaptation, a two-part miniseries in 1990. Because it's just not a multi-bestseller if it doesn't make a movie. So, anyway, in this maelstrom of sort of snowballing diagnoses, a whole genre being codified about this subject, that's when our history really starts. So, you might be like, LB, I thought this was a presentation about MPD group stuff. So far, all we are hearing about are just ones. Well, here we go. The There were probably plural umbrella folks meeting up long before the 80s. Like, it just seems obvious to me. Because if you are in a culture where certain forms of plurality are culturally accepted, then of course there will be more than one of you talking about it. Um, and even if you ignore all of that hypothetical and restrict it to, like, the Mary Reynolds on forward, the spiritualists had meetings. They were very well known for having meetings. Surely, at times, there were multiple mediums in a room talking about it with each other. Like, but as far as medical multiplicity goes, the first record I personally have found of a group of them getting together specifically to be among other multiples are support groups. The first one I know of is in Cleveland in 1980, and it was still running in 1989, so apparently it was fairly successful. There was also one, Akron, that ran since... Ak Akron? Akron. Thanks, thanks, Ohioan. Uh, there was one, Akron, that ran s at least from like 1987 to 1990, that I could find records of. Another two in Cincinnati, the... Uh, one in Cincinnati and one in New York City in 1988, and there were probably tons more I don't know about, because most of these support groups' anonymity was at a premium, um, and they were very ephemeral. Once the group dissolved, there was no record, and they just disappeared like feathers on a wind. 
Um, but we do still have record of some of the 12 goals for multiple personalities that came from the New York City support group, which, as you can see, this one is from 1988. And you can really tell that it's based on the the 12 step program and it specifically says use a 12 step incest survivors meeting and uh, but there are still some some of these that I want to read off specifically to bring up uh, it says the 12 goals for multiple personalities and among them is number four to accept our personalities as part of ourselves whether good or bad number five to understand work with our personalities instead of fighting with them number six to stop abusing our personalities. Number eight, to find alternatives to denying, suppressing, or banishing our personalities. Number nine, to encourage communication, cooperation, and assistance among our personalities. And number 10, to encourage our personalities to change, grow, and come into the present. These are all things that like multiples still struggle with today, of any kind. A bunch of these groups, they were sort of a uh, they tend to be support groups, and they were lumped into other sort of groups of that type. Uh, incest groups, 12-step groups, women's groups, lots of like survivors of domestic violence, child abuse, incest, stuff like that. Um, there were also conferences, but it's really hard to differentiate the ones that were for shrinks versus the ones for multiples themselves versus more general like women's cons, rape survival cons, all of that kind of thing. Apparently it was kind of confusing to others at the time, too. I found a newsletter with one multiple, like, advising to kind of keep your guard up at the pro-cons, because they don't actually, the shrinks aren't actually there for the multiples, they're there to talk about the multiples. And the events are not really actually for us. Speaking of newsletters, in February 1989, Many Voices starts, and it was a newsletter run by uh, multiple Lynn Wozniak out of Cincinnati, I think? Somewhere in Ohio. Um, and it ran continuously until 2012, at which point Wozniak got really sick and then she died. But she stipulated in her will that the entire archive of Many Voices be put on, digitized and put online for free in perpetuity perpetuity for anyone to read that once. So I highly recommend reading it. It is, it is one of the most continuous archives I have of multiple community of people talking amongst each other, sharing ideas, language, experiences, artwork, all that kind of stuff. And bec thanks to the Archive of Many Voices, like, it is responsible for a bunch of my earliest records of things like other kinds of plurality or trauma-based multiplicity than full, plain old multiple personality disorders, such as um, in December of 1990, one group mentions like several kids inside syndrome, which was probably just like an informal term used by folks within the group to discuss like Folks who aren't multiple, but had several inner children needing help and therapy. There were also, in June 1992, multi I saw records of multiples who claim no history of family abuse or trauma at all, which is the first I've seen of like this kind of medical multiple who's sort of like, but I'm not traumatized, but this is the framework that I know. We'll come back to that. There's also non-human headmates, including uh, this white lioness Sange, uh, this is from June 1992, and there's another one referenced elsewhere called Starflower, who is apparently kind of a cross between a starfish and an octopus. And I want to pause for a moment to say that, like, from everything I've heard, the other kin community uh, existed before this, and that other kin multiples were a part of that from sort of this very early in. That is a huge gaping hole in my knowledge. I don't know anything about them. Someone should talk about it! Who knows more about? Um, this is also, uh, Many Voices is also where the first time I've seen multiple self-declaring as systems, and that was in August 1992. Uh, system, or more specifically, System of Alters, was used by medical personnel for years prior. Like, uh, I was able to easily trace it back to Cluft in 1988, but I wouldn't be surprised if it went earlier than that. And so, 
but this it took a few years for multiples to start using it amongst themselves. And by the way, that means that if anyone tries to sell you that line about how system was created by traumatized multiples for traumatized multiples and anyone else using it is like bad, oppressive, wrong, they're lying. <laughs> they're lying. It's, everything I've seen is that system was coined by medical personnel to describe us and then we reappropriated it. Like it's not some sanctified word. Many Voices also has the first record I have of ro romantic and sexual relationships between headmates. Even though I am positive it existed before this, I am so positive. I would bet my back teeth on it. Like, it's just... It's too overwhelmingly common, even as people hide it, that I just... Yeah. But it's the first record I've been able to have, and because it's sort of a taboo subject, and it was then too. Like, even in a newsletter specifically for multiples, by multiples, and specifically the love and sex issue of it, people were still kind of like, hush hush about it. But at least we have a record that existed as early as 1993. Many voices also included, like, merchandise made by and for multiples, groups, like, Households, and there was even a nonprofit called the MPD Consortium that was trying to provide housing and rehab service. I don't know what became of them, but there was this growing sort of culture of multiples trying to help each other and do build their own inner sort of like support structures. Which leads us, and it, Many Voices also gives us record of the very first that I know of online multi community. BBS records! I'm afraid that I don't have much, uh, I don't really have slides because they all look like this. It's not particularly exciting, but the bulletin board services were kind of like proto forms, or if you prefer, think of it, very, very slow motion chat rooms. <laughs> um, the first, and the first that I was a first I ever heard record of was from the end of 1991 called Mars Station, which was uh, specifically for sexual abuse survivors, but apparently Mars Station may have run until 2004. That's a really long time for any online thing to keep going. Um, and then there are other ones I've heard of, but have very scant records of. I just know they exist, including The Love Galaxy from 92, Maxi's Toy from 89 to 98, Fire Chat from 92 to 94, MPD from 95 to 96, and SIP MPD from 95 to 96. Um, and that's basically what I just shared with you is everything I know about them for sure. Like, and not even that. Like, take those dates with a grain of salt that I gave you. Um, some of them were new age health things, some were spirituality, some were like specific like sexual abuse survivors. Um, and others might have just been general purpose and multiples just happen to congregate there, but they exist. And it's in these old BBS records that I actually find the first use of the word singlet, which was, I first saw it used in October of 1992, and it was apparently coined by Astrea, we'll come back to Astrea, don't you worry, uh, Astrea's creepy ex-husband, BC. And Astrea seemed completely, like, all use of singlet that has like spread out through like a bunch of multi communities as a whole is because of Astrea. Like it was all through places they were in. First the BBSs, then Usenet groups, then like forums, then their own website. We'll get back to that. But it's not just multiples who are starting to like congregate in newsletters and BBSs and mailing lists. Uh, it's the backlash too. Uh, these are folks who have bones to pick with multiples, like repressed memory, abuse ac accusations. This includes the Witch Hunt Information Center, which was around by 1993, and the big daddy of them all, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, who are thankfully gone as of this year and nothing of value was lost. Uh, but they started in 1992, and I don't want to go too deep into the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, but we can't really talk about multi-history without discussing them because they put such a huge ripple effect. Um, how the Full False Memory Syndrome Foundation started was there was a woman who was... 
If she wasn't a therapist already, she was training to become one, and she privately, like, spontaneously remembered that she had been molested by her father, Peter, and she went up to him basically being like, Dad, you molested me, that's not okay. And he was a member of the MIT staff, I think he actually might still work there if he's still alive, um, and he basically went, no, I didn't, and I'm going to create an organization devoted to defaming you and try and get you cut off from your job promotion. Because that's something that a healthy, reasonable human being does when quietly told their behavior is unacceptable. So the False Memory Syndrome Foundation was basically the abuser's lobby. Um, they never actually gave any data for their beliefs. They never even gave a definition, a proper definition of False Memory Syndrome. Their base, but their basic premise was that uh, child sexual abuse is vastly overreported, is taken way too credulously, and that the true victims are the poor innocent parents and families who are torn apart by like this per this person claiming abuse falsely. Sometimes it's this person is a malicious liar. Others is oh this poor my poor child is just very suggestible and like got this idea from all these books around that like. They were sacrificed to Satan when they were five. Like, you could spend over a decade just studying the memory wars and discussing it, and someone actually has. So, but suffice to say, False Memory Syndrome Foundation never defined False Memory Syndrome properly, never really gave any proper statistics about it. They vastly inflated their membership roster, and they were totally worthless as a scientific organization, but they were a hit as a uh, PR spin machine. Um, and it cast a huge ripple effect of on that generation of multiples, of which we're kind of at the tail end of. The idea that if you have memories of terrible things happening to you, they must be mistrusted. This feeling like, what if I am auto-suggesting these horrible memories for some reason? Like, and it, it casts a very long shadow, which we're finally starting to crawl out from under. And, yeah. Oh, and in the midst of all this chaos and struggle between, like, multiples and therapists who believe... Like, it's... There's a lot of chaos of people who are believing, frankly, fairly improbable, unbelievable things, down to folks who are just like, I'm having these memories of bad things happening, I think at least the core of them are true, down to fighting with folks who are like, no, this is all like a witch hunt, this is a fad, this is just a thing that's going. And in the midst of all this, the DSM-4 is coming out, and everyone's sort of like, so, what are you going to do about this? And the DSM-4 goes, well... How about we just quietly change the name of the diagnosis to from multiple personality to dissociative identity disorder, and we kind of hope this whole thing blows over. And they do. Did it work? Mm, I mean, like, and multiples became less in the intensely public eye after this, but personally, I think it was less because of all the changes and more that the multi-trauma story of, like, Sybil or The Minds of Billy Milligan or The Five of Me, it just became so rigid in its genre conventions that it kind of collapsed under its own weight. Like, there's only so many carbon copies you can make of a thing before people get bored of it, and I think just the fad machine moved on. So, that brings us to... Usenet. So, a lot of multiples had passionate opinions about the diagnosis change, as you might imagine. Some felt that DID was a euphemism, a way of being like, oh, you're not even personalities, you're just one dissociated identity. Other folks were kind of ho saying, well, you know, but MPD sounds so sensational, maybe DID will take some of the heat off us. Maybe it'll kind of, like, help make things less sensational. So, no one, you might say multiples were of two minds about uh, Hey. Mm -hmm. So, but I feel that this shows a greater problem in medical multi-communities of sort of letting doctors dictate us to us what our identities are. Where we look to doctors to tell us who we are. And it's one thing to be like, oh, the doctor says I have this condition. It's one thing for a doctor to say, this is who I am. And that's sort of an overriding concern I've had among my fellow medical multis. Like, 
when do you realize that a doctor is trying to help you, and when are you kind of letting a doctor shape who you are and what you're allowed to be? But anyway, on Usenet. Uh, multiples had been congregating on Usenet just like they had elsewhere in mailing lists and BBS and stuff like that. Uh, often in survivor groups, again, like alt.sexual.abuse.recovery, aka ASAR, um, and that was already in full spooling by 1991. I don't know when it started. Um, but it wasn't multi-specific, so in August 1994, alt.support.dissociation got created. And, uh, it's still sporadically active today, making it the longest still-running multi-group that I know of of any kind. Because that's like... that's a good 26 solid years it's been running. That's pretty impressive. Um, and both ASAR and ASD, they had some conventions that might seem kind of familiar to people now. Uh, namely, like, trigger warnings, uh, using things like spoilers, which was a huge bunch of blank lines so you couldn't accidentally read too far without meaning to for any sort of sensitive information. And then probably something that became more infamous, um, splats or trigger warnings where you replace, like for instance, say you want to say the word cult or parents, you would replace the U in cult with an asterisk or the A in parents so it wouldn't make the full word. Um, and there was an attempt to make these places a safe space, which, from what I have heard, kind of meant it became this very, like, people were constantly processing their processing about other people's processing, <laughs> and arguing over what words had to be splatted. Like, I saw parents splatted, I saw warning splatted, I saw religion splatted. It was very clear that no one was entirely sure what words were considered legit enough triggers to splat out. And there were things like people getting into big fights over someone saying, pay attention, someone being, I'm triggered by that, like, apologize to me. So you kind of had these, and also it meant like, in this world, in this online community where conflict was seen as like, deeply triggering, you kind of developed these really contorted social norms to avoid conflict, but still deal with conflict, which I think kind of ended up in a lot of processing each other's processing kind of deal. And... But something interesting about alt.support.dissociation, like other multigroups, it developed its own norms. And within a week of its creation, someone was there saying that they didn't see their multiplicity as a disorder, and the group had to discuss that. The next, the following day, the first version of their FAQ came up, where they gave a stipu- uh, the FAQ was made by Discord and Sapphire Gazelles. This is actually one of D Discord's sites right here. No relation to the web platform of nowadays. Um, and the FAQ gave room for the idea of multiples who did not have a history of trauma, but became multiple because they had a multi-caregiver. Like, they were raised by a multi-mom for something. Um, and by May 1995, the FAQ was expanded to make room for multiples who came to their multiplicity via things like roleplay, alternate social structures, whatever that means, and identity games. So alt.support.dissociation was still kind of giving room for this idea of multiples who didn't quite fit this strict, like, diagnosis or trauma history. Um, though they still found the idea of, like, having headmates from fiction or soul bonds really weird. We'll get to that later. One of the folks who hosts the ASD fac is Astraea. And this is how Astraea start getting, rising in the ranks on famous multiples online. They start co-laying resources from alt.support.dissociation and hosting it on their own website. Um, often improperly sourced or not sourced at all, and sometimes they would claim credit for things that they didn't do. You'll hear more about that in a bit. Oh, this is Discord's website. I was very excited to finally have colors and things in my slides. Uh, Discord actually got so fed up with the alt.support. Uh, alt ASAR, they, they got so sick of sort of like the the trying to sh strong. Do I need a pause? Oh, go ahead. 
need to strong arm the community into like this safe space that they finally left in disgust and created their own community called Sanctuary. All I know is that it existed and was made in 1995. I couldn't tell you much anything else about it. So ASAR creates its own domain, which is owned by a multiple, and so a lot of multiples join up and get their own domains on, including one of the first versions of Astraea's website. Um, another per Another multiple who was on the domain is Vicky's. Oh, wait. First, before I get to Vicky's, though, Astrea also created the first person plural web ring, or at least they claimed credit for it. Basically, anytime Astrea claims credit for something, I kind of have to double check it. But a web ring was created for other multiples to kind of like be aware of each other. And I realize that the youngs today may not know what a web ring is, but if you own your own website, say you want other people to visit your friends. In this case, like, you want other multiples to know, find other sites for multiples. Because this is before the existence of Google. This is back in the day of Alta Vista. You know, finding websites is actually kind of a tricky business. You create a web ring so that you can link to and from everybody's websites, and so you'll be able to find more folks. Vicky also gets on ASAR and coins the term mid-continuum, which is sort of in between multiple and singlet. Uh, they also use the word plural as an umbrella term for multiples and also folks who worry they aren't multiple enough or maybe sort of multi-ish. And they kind of tried to create like the idea, the whole reason they used the term mid-continuum was the idea that multiplicity was a continuum and singlets were on one end, and then you had really florid multiples at the other end. But there was still plenty of room in between these two. Um, Vickies were worried they were the only ones, but then on their website, uh, The Wonderful World of the Mid-Continuum, they started collecting a bunch of stories from other plurals about it and sharing them on their website. Um, so, mid-continuum, a very useful word, a very useful concept, but the fluidity of it and a later grudge from Astrea later wrecks them and pushes them out. But we... we'll come to that. Oh, we'll come to that. But before their grand falling out, Vicky's Astrea and the founder, a uh, system who went by Chris Roche, they tried to create uh, the Households United for Equality in 1999. Uh, household was a term in use on ASD and ASAR for multiples, systems, plurals, whatever. So it was households. So we would be the LB household, the Vicky's household, whatever. Um, the goal of Households United for Equality was educating the public and fighting myths about multiplicity, and it also stated that it was not a specific abuse support group, which was probably may have been Australia's doing, since Australia at this time were kind of pushing the idea that multiplicity wasn't necessarily, like, a bad thing. It could be a natural state of being. I'm fairly sure that Australia didn't come up with this idea. They popularized it and yoinked it from someone else, but we'll get to that. And... Households United for Equality didn't really achieve anything that I know of. Like, all it managed was it made some logos, it uh, sent out a couple of emails, it had disappeared in roughly a month, though Australia tried to pretend it still existed for a few months after that, another thing they'll do. But I want y'all to remember Households United, because we're going to come back to this idea of sort of like an online plural activism group. We'll get there. We'll get there. Meanwhile, some folks get so sick of kind of like the endless trigger warnings and arguments over what needs to be splatted and what is a safe space that they say, fuck all you fuckers, and create their own website. Probably one of the more well-known ones was Dark Personalities. Uh, I feel that this, this banner image kind of tells you everything to know about their sort of aesthetic and tone. Uh, the text underneath, in case you can't see it, is if you are in a multiple system and require trigger warnings and spoilers in order to function, we advise you go elsewhere. So, Dark Personalities kind of got made in backlash to this sort of, what I've heard sometimes referred to as the hug box, where everyone pretends to be happy all the time, and saying the word religion might cause a total, like, psychological meltdown. So the anachronic R&B kind of quit in disgust and made 
dark personalities to sort of show, openly discuss these darker topics. Uh, and they also created their own glossary of multi-terminology. Um, this is like where they were the ones who said like this is what singlet means, this is what made continuum means, this is what system means. Um, they, uh, Australia will later basically yoink their glossary wholesale and people will start associating it with them, but no, dark personalities did the legwork. It was them. Um, and also, dark personalities kind of had its own problems. From what I've heard, it kind of became a cage fight where since there was absolutely no warnings and showing emotions or pain was considered a sign of weakness, people would kind of just rip each other apart and any attempt to stop that was considered reducing free speech. You might be like, oh, this sounds really familiar. Yeah, the more things change, the more they seem the same. Um, dark personalities were also pretty ableist, which is, you can say that fairly true for a lot of multiples, but dark personalities were more open about it, where they talked about, they talked about their multiplicity as a state of being, not disorder, no integration required, not necessarily caused by trauma. Australia will later yoink this and popularize it, but as far as I can tell, dark personalities did it first. Um, and they had a very intense ableist disdain for people who weren't able to be employed in the traditional workforce. Like yours truly, making y'all look bad since 2007. Uh, they, yeah, they tend to see, they created the term empowered multiple and created this sort of like the empowered multiples movement and, well, if you could call it a movement, a thing. They made it a thing. Um, and they specifically put themselves in opposition to what they called survivor multis, who they kind of portrayed as sniveling, whining, useless babies. Yeah, multiples are really mean to each other. Like, I see some of the faces y'all are making. Like, this is also a history of slap fights and grudge wank. I hope y'all enjoy the story of my people. Uh, but, meanwhile, back at the ranch, completely different non-traumatized plural umbrella groups are forming. Totally unfamiliar with these guys and all their grudge wank. For instance, the other kin multiples. I don't know a whole lot about them, but they made Kinships magazine, and there were some pretty big, like, other... I just realized, I should define what other kin are. So, other kin are folks who see themselves as not human, like, they may have a human body, but they themselves are not. Uh, it was originally intended for more, like, uh, mythological beings, elves, um, angels, stuff like that. Uh, sort of in contrast to folks, I don't remember what the term was, I guess people would call them furries. But furries were their own distinct thing. Um, other kin layer came for, like, anyone who had a non-human identity, but it was originally more a mythological <coughs> association. And there were a bunch of... Oh, that was a mouse. Sorry. And, uh, whoa, no, go away. There we go. And kinships ran for a good number of issues, and they, but among the contributors were some pretty well-known multiples, for instance, the Chris's of kinhost.org, who run the Bootstrap Guide to Multiplicity. They're still around, and, uh, They've gone by many names. I knew them as Doltige, Castellan, and uh, Downtide, who, they were a pretty cool multiple. They also invented the Otherkin star. If you've seen this around Otherkin, it was created by, like, an Otherkin multiple. So, that was a thing. And these people are coming to their understanding of plurality basically independently from the medical multiplicity and all of this sort of survivor movement thing. They were seeing it more as like, I guess you'd call it a more metaphysical experience. If you'd ask me, they're almost like, though they aren't direct descendants or anything, it seemed to like have been carrying on the tradition that like the spiritualists had of this sort of like past lives, mythology, stuff like that. And then we have the soul bonders. So people have probably like authors and other artists or creative types have probably been talking to their characters as separate entities for a very, very long time. Like, I was able to chase it back to, like, Fernando Pessoa back in the 1890s, I think. But after that point, I was like, whatever, it goes back over a hundred years. 
but the idea of soul bonding and treating it as like more than just what anyone else did was 1996 it was the Word soul bonding was created by a woman named Amanda Flowers in a private mailing list of which the records have vanished into the internet ether called Just for Writers. Uh, the mailing list was intended just to just for writers. Uh, mainly teenage fanfic writers from what I've heard, but a whole bunch of them were soul bonders and they got to talking about like, hey, do you ever feel like your characters are alive? Yeah, yeah, I do. They have really passionate opinions about what I'm doing sometimes. And they, they're like, what should we call it? Let's call it Soul Bonding. Apparently it was based on like the Soul Blazer games. Because, um, you know, they were teenagers having fun. And then the word started to spread, in part thanks to the list of that Kurai made of various Soul Bonders through from 2000 to 2002, and then it got picked, 2003, and then it got picked up by someone else collecting oral histories for a few years longer. Like... And because a lot of the people on Just For Writers were very active online, it spread. Like, they created their own. If you get a bunch of writers who call it soul buying and they start writing stories where they call it soul bonding that other people read, more people learn what it is. Like, there's a story from Laura Gilkey, or I guess she's called Laura Esper up here. Uh, she wrote a story called uh, The Trinity in 2002, which helped spread. Uh, it's there was a, a collective made their own soul bonding thing and there were a bunch of people who came from soul bonding who later came over to the multi camp or went back and forth or were both at the same time we'll get to that um and then it spread to live journal which was sort of the hip happening spot at the time uh, the Soul Bind, there was a community on Live Journal called Soul Bonding in 2002, but by December 2003, people were kind of cross fertilizing between the Soul Bonding com and the Multiplicity com. And more and more people started comparing and contrasting their experiences and going, like, hey, like, I may have suffered intense trauma in life, but, like, I also have a headmate of, like, my role playing character. Or maybe a soul buyer is like, you know, like, I've always seen, like, my experiences being through creativity, but I also kind of got smacked around as a kid. And so there are more people sort of exploring, like, these in-betweens. And sometimes the exact line between soul bond and soul bonder and multiple became really, really fuzzy. Like, again, kind of a spectrum -y thing. On the one side, you have, like, the people who is, like, you know, Leonard Nimoy, he might talk to Spock, and Spock might talk back, but Spock doesn't buy the groceries. Spock doesn't, you know, go joyriding in Leonard Nimoy's car. But what happens if a soul bond, their soul bonds do start, like, interacting in the corporeal world? Or what if you're a multiple who has a lot of headmates who, you know, they're Bugs Bunny, or Othello, or Hamlet, or whatever? Like, what does that mean? And so on LiveJournal, you start having, like, a lot of community mixing that wasn't allowed before. Because LiveJournal was set up that you could join as many communities as you wanted. You could join the other kin community, the multiplicity community, and the soul buying community. And, like, learn from all of them. And this is sort of a history that I think gets forgotten, is just how much help the soul bonders gave uh, multiple com and plural communities after them. Like, it's because of soul bonders that Tumblr sort of saw fictivity, or having fictional, fictive headmates, as not necessarily a total terrible thing. While on alt.support.dissociation, if you bring it up there, they'll be like... Go away. So again, the sort of cultural norm. Also... <laughs> Oh, it's okay to laugh. It's okay to laugh. Another reason soul bonding probably became fairly well known was probably due to mockery and wank comms. Like, no one wants to admit that, and it's not exactly the most honorable or lovely thing, but soul bonders got mocked a lot on the internet. Like, in 2006, there was the infamous Snape's on an Astral Plane post on Fandom Wank of a bunch of women who saw themselves as, who got called as the Snape Wives, 
who saw themselves as basically soulmated to sever a snake on the astral plane. And then they got into fights over who was truly who was truly deserving of like the fan of Severus title. And Phantom Wink got a hold of it. Which is hilarious because one of the mods of Phantom Wink, Shoi Ryu, you might notice that name is there on the soul bonding list. There was a lot of hypocrisy in the wanking. Soul bonding probably also got a big boost in the public eye because of mockery comms, including probably the most infamous snakes on an astral plane, uh, or the Snape wives as they call them, a bunch of women who soul bonded Severus and saw themselves as soul mated to him on the astral plane. Um, there was a lot of hypocrisy, a lot of respectability politics, a whole lot of people like, let me tell you, as someone who, like, was around for some of these wanks, a lot of the people ridiculing the Snape wives were soul bonders with their own Snape on a pl astral plane. Like, there was a whole lot of hypocrisy. No one wanted to admit they were like them, and they kind of projected their self-hate outward. There was also Encyclopedia Dramatica, who were in sort of responsible for the shutdown of the live journal soul bonding community. Um, they got a hold of us, they started mocking us in 2007-2008. We were possibly infiltrated by someone who was possibly multiple or a possible soul bonder themselves, who then, like, I actually had a chat with the person who tried to infiltrate, and they claimed to be multiple, and it was a really strange conversation. And then they later went and spewed it all. It all ended up on Encyclopedia Dramatica. The soul bonding community got locked down hard, and now it's been deleted, and the records are just gone. So, a shame. A terrible shame. Yeah, here's the post from my protagonist, aka Wondershock, who basically came, interviewed a few soul bonders to make a college paper on us and kind of mock us. It all ended up on Encyclopedia Dramatica. We're on live draw at this time, and I've already mentioned that they sort of like merged a whole lot, and I won't cover that again. So, the Multiplicity community got made in 2000? Yeah, the end of 2000. And there was a lot, you might notice that even it, by 2002, you had other kin under the under the community info. Like, there was already starting to be, like, this kind of mixing in between. And you see Dolta Gay, who did the other kin star, there among the members right there. And I'm sure there are others whose names that I just do not recognize. So, remember how I mentioned will you come back to the households united for, for equality? In 2002, Pavilion Hall and the Lancers got made, and they were basically a rehash of Households United. It is the same goal, trying to, like, spread education and dispel myths about multiplicity. Um, no members in common that I know of, except for Astrea, um, who is not in charge. Uh, Blackbirds and later Hondas became in charge. But they were kind of notable for being huge dickweeds and also not getting anything done um they were extreme they were authoritarian in their structure there were only like five multiples doing the bulk of the work but apparently there was like you were assigned homework to do and you were like compelled to do as much work as possible and the rosters were inflated and it was a weird trippy time it only managed to do anything for like five months, but it still claims to be alive today. Astray has basically held it up as like this kind of like Potemkin activism group for over a decade, pretending it's still active when it isn't. And the only things that, like, it did a few media reviews, there were a few essays that got recycled from earlier blog sites, um, they yoinked the glossary from Dark Personalities and recycled it, and then later when Pavilion stopped doing anything, Astrea pulled it and it became more famous there. But the only real achievement that Pavilion did was creating the term median, which was the exact same thing as mid-continuum. So as far as I can tell, uh, the folks at Pavilion got a grudge against Vicky's for some reason. I don't really know what it is. And Vicky's had built into mid-continuum by its very nature, the idea of there being a continuum of plurality. Um, but Dark Personalities took issue with the idea of a continuum, and Pavilion Hall just basically rehashed 
their criticism, and then also claimed that, like, saying mid-continuum was, like, for some reason medicalizing people who didn't want to be, even though Vicky's never did that. And so they created the term median to, like, avoid all of that, but median became the exact same thing. They also came up with, Pavilion Hall also came up with this really bizarre metaphysical claim of the differences between multiples, medians, and singlets, and tried to lump all soul bonders into, un, into the concept of median. There was apparently trying to go and evangelize to soul bonders, which did not go over well. And, yeah. It was a thing that existed. Then in 2007, LiveJournal took its huge hit thanks to the Warriors for Innocence, who, it's unclear whether they were trolling or legit, but they basically got LiveJournal to insta-ban 500 people, over 500 accounts. Um, they claimed that they were fighting pedophilia, by which we mean Harry Potter fic writers, and also a whole bunch of communities and people got banned who listed anything like rape in their interests, such as a rape survivor community. So a lot of people left LiveJournal. But the multiple, multiplicity community and soulbind communities kind of like managed to stagger on, but multiplicity the, on LiveJournal got its back broken by plural anon, which in January of 2011 kind of infiltrated the multiplicity com and then started like giving an anonymous sort of mockery thing. But here's the thing about Plural Anon. Plural Anon itself wasn't, was just sort of like the catalyst. There were some good parts about the plural communities on LiveJournal. I've mentioned that there was a lot of cross-fertilization between different communities, a lot of sort of sharing different strengths and weaknesses, but like some big minuses of the live journal thing was it sort of in some ways inherited some of the ASD and ASAR problems of no one really wanting to have conflict and so everything got buried. Like if you got, so if you say started getting harassed on plural anon and you knew who was harassing you, if you went to the mods of LJ Multiplicity and went this person, another member of the community is like sending me death threats, there were you would very easily get a response like, well, as long as it's not happening in our backyard, we're not going to do anything. They're still a member in good staying as long as they behave in the calm. And so that meant that like everybody's resentment kind of got suppressed. And once Plural Anon gave an anonymous outlet for it, there was just an exploding geyser of rage and resentment and bile stored up from years and years of grudges. The moderators of Multiplicity, one of which was Estrella, they're kind of a dick, uh, were pretty inactive and passive through all of it. And part of the problem was the entire moderating team of LJ Multiplicity at this time was Estrella and two of their abuse victims. So power dynamics were just all through it. And that basically kills the live journal plural communities. They all flee to... Not the DSM-5, but in a way they kind of do. They go to Tumblr. And in 2013, the DSM-5 comes out. DID, the diagnosis, remains unchanged, which is the only time it has stayed the same name through any, diag any DSM. Um, however, a new diagnosis gets made. Dissociative disorder not otherwise specified gets changed to otherwise specified dissociative disorder. And if you're wondering, does that make any difference? Yes, because everyone loses their fucking shit about it on Tumblr. Loses their goddamn fucking minds over a diagnosis that didn't even exist until 2013. And there's the, except the only people who aren't on Tumblr are the Tulpamancers who are busy being on 4chan and Reddit in 2009. But we're kind of running low on time. They exist. They are topomancers. They are a thing. Continue. So, uh, on Tumblr, with the change of the DSM-5, and also the changing norms of, or rather, the changing design of the internet, things start to change. And yet, in some ways, they say the same. Part of the power of LiveJournal, and also kind of its problem, was that you could lock things behind filters, you could block people out if you didn't want to, and that meant that you could keep trolls from infiltrating you sometimes, 
but it also meant that you could talk, do a whole lot of like cloak and dagger hiding behind each other's backs. Tumblr, everyone was shoved together all the time. You know, you couldn't really, you could block people, but it took five seconds to create a new account. So like, it was all public. And it did inherit some of the live journal traditions because a lot of live journals moved there. So since Tumblr had this extremely public thing, you start having like these different things of trying to keep people out of your space. You get these weird policing of tags like, oh, if you don't have this diagnosis, don't use this tag. You start having tags that get created and backlash to those tags. And, and even though like a bunch of, even though the Tumblr multiples and plurals inherited from like live journal soul bonding and multiplicity and fiction kin and other kin all getting squished together, some of the subtleties are getting lost. Like soul bonding had the concept of insourced versus outsourced. Outsourced being like Bugs Bunny, Othello, you know, characters that you did not create in source for characters you did create, say, your role-playing character, your fan fiction protagonist, whatever. Um, but Tumblr didn't really know that and had no way to know since a lot of live journal communities were locked down or deleted and hard to find. And so back to the DSM-5, when OSDD got created, everyone started losing their minds over it, over the subtleties of this diagnosis and what meant that you could be multiple and what you didn't. And on top of that, you start having what we call the Genic Wars. The first time I personally ever encountered this concept was in August 7th, 2014, um, where Trash Can Collective, aka Not Your Fucking Pet, uh, they sent me an ask on Tumblr asking me about folks who were telling them that like the words multiple and system were owned by, by DID systems they were created by and for the DID community, and anyone using the word multiple or system was appropriating. Which was co conflating a diagnosis with a culture, which isn't true, and it's actually factually historically inaccurate, but it had a lot of sway over young people who were worried about being oppressive bigots. Trashcan Collective responded by trying to create a whole new set of words that nobody had ever used ever before involving multiples, namely endogen, which later became known as endogenic. So they decided, well, if the words are the problem, we'll just create a whole new set of words that have never been associated with the community, and that'll solve the problem, right? No. <laughs> Everyone loses their shit, and anyone who has spent any time on certain multiple communities on Twitter, Tumblr, or Discord are now familiar with this sort of raging fight between traumagenic multiples and endogenic multiples. Even though these were terms that did not exist, and this fight, as far as I can tell, did not exist until late in 2014. All of this seems to have been engineered. I don't know by who, and I don't know why, but it is not true. It does not follow with any of the history that I have elucidated so far. All of this is, it's a layer cake of bullshit. It's based on a false, like, false logic assumption, but it seems to have really spread to the point that I'm now starting to in encounter this sentiment in my real corporeal offline life, where I'll have people come up to me at tables and ask if I'm a, an endo or what I think about endos. And my response is, they have a huge, decades-long tradition in our communities. And even the met, like, if you consider the spiritualist a non-trauma-based form of plurality, it goes back over a century. If you take in, like, those old multiples where there is no record of trauma in them, they get counted under it too, and some of them were the biggest cases of our history in the old medical literature. Anyone who's trying to claim that we have always been at war with Eurasia are wrong, and they are trying to sell something. And it concerns me about what I've been seeing as a rising tendency towards authoritarianism in our plural communities of deciding that anyone, it's not even their actions, it's their identity that is inherently oppressive. And any words that they use to describe that identity or that experience is oppressive. So I'm hoping that we can continue moving, f we can move forward and leave this behind, and this can also eventually be 
some stupid thing that we forget and don't have to think about anymore. Thanks for coming. Woo!